Hi, just a quick and interesting follow-up video here to my one uh, where I measured the noise of the microcurrent with the OPA189 op amp using my uh, HP Dynamic Signal Analyzer using the power spectral uh, density uh, to get the uh, microvolts per root hertz noise from 0 to 100 kilohertz here. And I thought I'd just show you an interesting aspect to do with shielding. Now I've got the microcurrent inside here, it's got the OPA189 op amp, we're measuring noise from uh, uh, zero to oh well 256 hertz up to uh, one kilohertz here because it's only got 400 points so you can't go to exactly uh, zero at the start anyway um look we're getting some interesting little spikes in there. I've got a hundred averages on and I've got the cursor right there and you'll notice that it's actually uh, around about 25 kilohertz there for this spike. What is this spike here? Aha, uh -huh. is that the switching frequency because the OPA189 is a chopper amplifier? No, well, as I explained in a previous video, that's um, way off. Uh, it's up in like the 200 to 300 kilohertz region up here, which is beyond the measurement capability of this dynamic signal analyzer. It's only, and this is only designed for DC to 100 kilohertz. So what is this 25 kilohertz spike here? And look, there's two other spikes here. And if I go over, I've got to use the fast mode because it's otherwise it's going through 400 points. Aha, uh -huh, 50 kilohertz. And what's this one over here? Well, you guessed it, 75 kilohertz. So 25, 50, and 75 kilohertz. Uh huh. These might be some, uh, you know, submodulation frequency of the uh, of the switching frequency of the op amp. But no, that's not it. Watch what happens if we. Let's actually um, start that measurement again, but let's actually remove the lid. Ta-da! Look, they're going uppity doo da. Look at that, a <laughs> significant difference. So it's not fundamentally the switch in frequency of the uh, chopper amplifier, the Auto Zero amplifier here. So what is this? Uh -huh. um, for those playing along at home, you might have guessed old school CRT, cathode ray, dis ray oscilloscope. These are electromagnetic devices. They have big thump and coils in them which generate large magnetic fields and a common switching frequency happens to be 25 kilohertz. So that's actually what we're measuring here is the switching frequency of the uh, CRT oscilloscope here. So I'm switching, it's the uh, horizontal um, scan rate of the uh, CRT here. And by taking off the top lid on here, we're easily seeing those spikes and I won't actually physically take it out and all that and we could get higher, it doesn't matter. But you know, if we put the lid on, let's start that again. There we go, if we put the lid on, it's going down, but it's not going to go down to zero. And this has to do with an excellent video I've done, if I may so much say myself. I don't have the original, but this is just a this is just a tribute. Um, uh, to number 1273, linked in down below at the end if you haven't seen it, where I explain near field versus far field uh, EMC. And how there are both um, uh, H field, which is a magnetic field, and the E field, which is the electric field. And th this is uh, distance from the source in terms of uh, wavelength of the uh, frequency. And when you're what's called near field, when your device is physically near to your source like this, the electric fields and the magnetic fields actually differ. They actually separate like this. It's only when you get uh, basically a wavelength pi on two uh, distance away, do they start to uh, combine to form the EM field or the electromagnetic radiation that you're more familiar with. The electric and magnetic fields combine in the far field, i.e. further away you go, to give you an electromagnetic field. And that's what you used to with, you know, like RF shielding and all that sort of stuff, is you know, you're talking typically uh, far field shielding. But when you're very close like this to a magnetic source, in this case, um, we're going to get the electric uh, field um, noise as you know from various things around as well as the magnetic uh, field coming from the CRT which is you know behind there it's like a you know a foot away or something I don't know how deep this uh, CRT is but it's pretty darn close and we're able to pick up the magnetic field even through this shielded box and even when I have the input 
uh, grounded like this, so it's gone to mains earth ground. So this box is completely shielded, right? But it's a die cast alloy box. And both uh, copper and aluminium and die cast alloys like this aren't particularly good at shielding down at, you know, DC to low frequencies in terms of what's called the near field. They can shield electric, electric fields, but they can't shield magnetic fields. The magnetic fields, uh, well, they not perfectly go through, but they, they're attenuated a little bit, but they will, they can penetrate completely shielded boxes like this and you know typically as a rule of thumb you might say uh, copper is you know pretty much only good for kind of like you know the kilohertz range and above anything sort of like below that is going to uh, like anything you know really low frequency stuff uh, below say you know roughly a kilohertz or so is not going to be shielded by copper so you can have a completely you know completely welded copper or aluminium uh, box that's completely shielded but magnetic fields will still get through so let's actually do a uh, little experiment here I've got because this is 25 kilohertz, this is actually quite, you know, relatively high frequency. Copper should actually work. So what I've got here is I've got a large uh, copper clad. It's the old school. Uh, this is a positive photoresist uh, coating. That's why it looks uh, green. Hasn't been exposed, but, you know, big one ounce copper sheet like this. We should, at 25 kilohertz, we should see this um, actually go away. So we'll start that again. Actually, let's take the lid off. And then we'll, sorry, you won't be able to see it, but well, I'll put that in there like that. Let's start and let's wait a bit. And we'll be able to see that this copper sheet's probably going to do the business. Um, whereas the aluminium, the die cast box, let's, let's have a look. Ready? Take it away. It might, it's still averaging. Well, it's still there. You can still see it. And when I took it away, it was quite low, but it was still there. So uh, having that one big copper sheet there was actually better than both, uh, than the uh, die cast box here. And if we use both, we'll probably find that it goes away we can pretty much make make that go away completely. I know this is not the best example. If this was down at like, you know, 100 hertz or something, mag magnetic field, this copper sheet pretty much wouldn't do, it had attenuated a little bit, but it pretty much wouldn't do uh, jack all. So, yeah, let's, there we go. Yep, yep, it's basically completely gone, and you'll see it start moving up again there. And let's actually try to do this same thing with a... An aluminium sheet like this just adds some more, although aluminium is not perfect, but we'll pretty much see that go away, I suspect. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much Gonski. But you'll notice that although the copper clad worked reasonably well, if I just put some copper perf board like that, well, that's not, that's not doing too terrific, is it? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, once again, it's, it's the copper but it's not a continuous sheet and it's not a large uh, sheet. So the magnetic fields are uh, getting through that, no problems whatsoever. And if we put the aluminium lid through like that, no, nope, that's not gonna do the business. You really need to, you really need to mostly shield that. So it can drop down, but it's not gonna be perfect. And you'll notice that that sheet is not on its own without the lid is not going to do much it has has attenuated it a little bit see it goes back up but you need the combination you need to really play whack-a-mole here don't know if you can no you can't see that i can see the i can just see the uh, waveforms through there there we go and she's gone ski and she's back so to really get down to the lower uh, shielding, lower frequency stuff, like, you know, down in hundreds of hertz, you know, the sub kilohertz uh, range right down to DC, you need you need to start getting um, what's called a high permeability uh, steel. So you need, like, a mu metal, it's called. There's, you know, specific, like, brands and types of mu metal. They have a high permeability so they don't saturate uh, as much. And, you know, pretty much like a steel uh, will do the job, but a 
a low carbon steel would do better than a high carbon uh, steel, for example, because the saturation uh, point is higher, so it can you know absorb more of that um, magnetic uh, field before it saturates, and then well, it can't you know <laughs> do the job anymore and uh, shield that. So if we put a steel sheet between these, let's try that. I don't know a type of. I just got this from one of my instruments, so. Let's give it a burl, and we should find that steel should work pretty darn well, especially at uh, 25 kilohertz with uh, no shielding on the top of the box there, and ta-da, completely gone. And she goes back up, look at that, beautiful. That's the high permeability of steel doing the business on the H field. So there you go, I just thought that is an interesting little example of how we can pick that up and of course if we move this away if we move it away we'll probably find that it's not going to pick it up any not going to pick it up as well anymore there you go it's only when we get closer 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 unfortunately you've got to sort of like restart the averaging because it's, it's too noisy if i don't have the averaging on but yeah we can get closer and there you go just really goes to town there <laughs> so there you go Hope you found that interesting and useful. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.